All right. So uh, welcome everybody uh, to the grant and grant writing for collections care projects uh, presentation today. My name is Eileen Corcoran. I am the community outreach manager at the Vermont Historical Society. And we are excited to be co-hosting this program today with the Collections Care and Conservation Alliance. Um, so I just wanna sort of talk about a couple little technical notes again for anybody who's come in. Uh, we do generally ask that people keep themselves muted, especially when presentations are going on. Um, we, we love seeing questions. Uh, please use the chat function as much as possible for that. Uh, if you would like something sort of addressed immediately or, or there's an issue, uh, you can also use the um, sort of the, the reactions or raising your hand option uh, as well. We'll try to grab folks as needed for that. Um, and again, just the general plug for uh, VHS programs going on. Um, we've got a bunch on our calendar for October and November. Um, but the big one I want to share today uh, is our annual League of Local Historical Societies and Museums Conference, which is going to be virtual this year. That's October 30th and 31st. Um, and I will put the link to that uh, information in uh, the chat function, but it's a great sort of program with sessions on things like online exhibits and virtual uh, summer camps and, and some, some great stuff that people have been doing, uh, especially in relation to what we're going through now. And the folks, uh, some of the folks from the CCCA will be joining us Saturday morning for that, for coffee and chat. Um, so it's another good chance to, to talk with all these wonderful people again. So uh, I'll put that in the chat for that. Uh, but at this point, I think I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Darlene, uh, who's gonna talk a little bit more about CCCA. Excellent, thank you, Eileen. And good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for our second workshop. Uh, also, thank you, Eileen and the Vermont Historical Society for co-sponsoring this workshop with the Collections Care Alliance and for hosting us on the Zoom platform. My name is Darlene Bielowski, and I am a contract museum registrar and fine and decorative arts appraiser here in Southwest New Hampshire. My clients, which include museums, cultural organizations, historical societies, private collectors, artists, are from all over the country. I've worked in the museum field for over 25 years in places such as the Pocumptic Valley Memorial Association and Historic Deerfield and the Springfield Museums in Springfield, Mass, where I was the sole registrar for four museums and two satellite exhibition spaces, which were at the Smith & Wesson Manufacturing Plant and Shooting Academy. I sit on the boards of Red Arch Cultural Heritage Law and Policy Research and I serve as its president. I also sit on the board of the Center for Painted Wall Preservation, and sit on the board for the Collections Care and Conservation Alliance and serve as its president. The Collections Care and Conservation Alliance, which we uh, fondly call CCCA, was incorporated last year as a Vermont registered nonprofit. Our board is comprised of archivists, collections management professionals, conservators who live in Vermont, Eastern New York and Western New Hampshire. It's a network of professionals working together to support the care and conservation of our region's cultural heritage collections and materials by way of providing information and education to individuals and entities caring for art, artifacts, historical records, and other collections. We work with cultural institutions, artists, private collectors, municipalities, and others to help improve collections care. So please check out our website. I'll be posting if, um, you can already see it in the beginning of the chat. I'll be posting it again in a few minutes. Um, and there will be other information included throughout the webinar, which will all be included in an email to you as we follow up afterwards. We'd like to have you subscribe to our mailing list, which will give you an announcement in advance of any news or events or programs that we are participating in. And membership in the CCCA is now open. Details are on our website, and I encourage you to apply. We're planning some events for each of our membership categories. And if you're eligible to become a professional affiliate, our second networking opportunity in conversations with colleagues is tentatively scheduled for October 15th at the Norwich Historical Society in Norwich, Vermont from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. weather permitting. A third will be virtual and again, co-sponsored with the Vermont Historical Society on November 17th, and that will be at 12 noon. We'll be organizing other such events in neighboring states as our memberships grow. 
And we'll out, we are also working on programming for 2021, which will be a combination of in-person and virtual events. Both of our panelists this morning sit on the CCCA board. Rachel Oniv is the director of the Vermont Historical Records Program based at the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. In this role, she offers technical assistance to cultural heritage repositories through site visits and reports, workshops and trainings, and serving as an ongoing resource. In addition to the Collections Care and Conservation Alliance, she's an active member of the Vermont Arts and Culture Disaster and Resilience Network, known as VARTDARM, and the Vermont Suffrages Centennial Alliance. Past jobs include serving as roving archivist for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and director of archives at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. She taught as an adjunct for Simmons College School of Library and Information Science and worked as an independent consultant for many years. Erica Donis is a graduate of the Winterthur Program in Early American Culture and has more than 20 years experience working with museums, archives, historical societies, and historic sites, both as an employee and consultant. She's based in Burlington, where she currently serves as Special Collections Director for Champlain College. Erica also manages a consulting practice specializing in curatorial, collections management, and exhibition projects. She serves as Triple CA Secretary. And without further delay, may I introduce the webinar, Grants and Grant Writing for Collections Care. Ladies. Darlene, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. So thrilled that you've joined us. Um, little bit of uh, an agenda for you and a caveat. Uh, we're going to cover an awful lot of material in the next hour and a half or so. And I, I want this to be just an introduction, an introduction to the topic and an introduction to us, uh, to Triple CA um, and to my program specifically in terms of being a resource for you as you uh, conceptualize and draft and submit uh, grant proposals. Um, one of the things I do in my role is to help institutions with their grant proposals. Um, I helped with a couple of large NEH projects that are pending right now and um, worked with the Department of Libraries in the last couple of years to do a similar workshop to this that then led to libraries applying for IMLS, um, Accelerating Promising Practices grants. Um, this was a really competitive program and each year a Vermont library uh, was successful in getting a community memory project grant funded. I also worked with an institution this uh, late this spring on an NEH CARES grant that was successful. Um, and it's something I'm, I'm passionate about, both helping individual institutions and always kind of scheming about, about bigger grants that I could work on and develop that might help all of us in Vermont um, improve the way we're able to care for our collections, preserve them and provide access to them. So always looking for collaborators and always looking for, um, for folks I can help with their, own, with their own ideas. So with that in mind, um, I just wanna say, we're, we're, I'm, I, this is a, a topic I'm incredibly excited about. So I'm gonna try to not go on and on and on and on. Um, but I wanna encourage you, and we'll, we'll come back to this at the end, uh, encourage you to think of this as just the beginning. And we really do hope that we can build a cohort coming out of this webinar today that wants to work together um, in some fashion on their own proposals um, with support from us. So I'm going to talk about the kind of the big picture stuff um, uh, relating to grants and grant writing and then pass the baton over to Erica um, and she'll dive into what you might want to be considering more specifically as you kind of hone in on what your proposal might be, what your project's going to try to uh, try to cover. And Questions, as Eileen said, um, it's difficult for me to see what's come in, but I, you know, if she starts jumping up and down, I can see that on my Zoom, and um, and we can we can either pause and have questions as they come up or um, or at the end. So without further ado, uh, some of the things you want to think about as you think about grants, the big picture. The only other thing I'm going to say as way of introduction is that. Grants have been a huge part of my own professional life. I am currently grant funded in part. Um, my first position 25 years ago coming out of library school was grant funded. Uh, and I've been a project archivist with Mellon Foundation funding and relied on uh, National Historical uh, 
Publications and Records Commission funding and HPRC funding uh, many, many years, both in Massachusetts and, and currently in Vermont. So like it or not, grants are, uh, are a reality and they're part of how we fund ourselves and part of how we get get our get our dreams fulfilled of how we in how we get what we want to get done at our at our repositories accomplished um, in in an ideal world we would all be fully funded and not have to expend so many resources in terms of our own time and energy on developing these these grants and following through with them but that's it's kind of it's the way it is so um, i'm still grateful that they're out there one really important thing to do and this is why it's never too early to start thinking about grant, um, about applying for a grant, is to make sure you're ready to. There is so much that you will be so grateful when you actually settle down to uh, draft a project proposal and work on a narrative. You'll be so happy if you already have these things lined up. Um, and of course, there's other, other good reasons uh, institutionally why it's useful to have them in place. Mission statement. Uh, know what it is that is, the, what the reason is for why you are doing what you're doing. Um, what is, what's the purpose of your institution? Really important to have some sort of strategic plan or at least some identified priorities. Um, what is it that you want to try to achieve in order to fulfill your mission. Uh, that then should also be supported with uh, policy and procedure documents specific to collections. Um, if you're going for a collections related project proposal, you're going to want to make sure that you've got certain, certain, you know, some sort of collection management plan in place um, and perhaps even a preservation plan. And I can talk a bit more about that. It can be a standalone document that uh, identifies how you are going to work toward preserving um, your collections, or it can be some component of your strategic plan. And that's kind of a whole side discussion on whether that should be a standalone plan or embedded within the strategic plan. The advantage of that is that it can be um, something that is seen within the larger realm of your institution's priorities and not as kind of this sidebar that maybe only the collections people look at and think about. Also really important to make sure that there's institutional commitment, um, that you're not doing this alone. And I learned this the hard way when I was at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, I saw an opportunity from the Grammy Foundation and was working with a volunteer who, um, who was interested in, we had a lot of old recordings on, on vinyl. And with, with him, the two of us together kind of whipped up a proposal and submitted it. We were not successful for all sorts of reasons, um, but it also uh, was something where I sat down with the president and he said, you, you can't just go do this by yourself. You know, you need to get, you need to have our support. Where was this project going to actually happen in HSP? Um, so you need to know that it's something that everyone is behind, um, and that it's, it aligns with with the other the other things that you know, are trying to be achieved by other other departments, other staff, depending how large you are. Data is huge, and we'll talk more about this later. Um, what what do you have to show that you've been taking care of your collection? that you are aware of how it's being used, um, that you're doing all you can to mitigate environmental concerns. Um, it shows responsibility and responsiveness. So that's all going to help you as you make a case for your project. Um, so good to have, have that and to have been gathering that for some time. So if you don't have a um, means for, for, for tracking things, try to determine how you could start to to, to count whether it's people using your website, people coming in or requesting access to collections virtually, um, monitoring your environmental conditions, all of that is really wonderful to be doing and to be able to show you have been doing. So it's never too early to start if you're not already tracking those types of, of things that can be quantified. Also great, and that's why it's wonderful to, to have you here on the webinar today is to be aware of who's in your, in your neighborhood um, or who has expertise 
that you might want to call on um, as you're as you're working on a project. And most conservators and other professionals, they're happy to talk to you about what you're thinking about for a project um, and to help you shape that and not just kind of write a letter of commitment saying, yes, I will, you know, if you wanted Michelle Pagan to work on your textile collection, you know, it wouldn't be just her mailing in a letter saying, yeah, I'll do the work. She would be, I'm sure, great, you know, glad to engage with you about, well, these are the textiles you really should focus on. Let's show that you've spent some time thinking about this in a thoughtful way before you actually um, ask for some money. So that's all kind of internal housekeeping stuff to be, to be working on. And a lot of that is kind of ongoing iterative um, activities. Hopefully it aligns with some of the work that you are doing already uh, for, your, for your organization. Also good to kind of look up and look about you in terms of being aware of, of the scene, if you will. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some trends in, um, in what funders are, are seeking and a bit about the two most common types of funding, government funding and foundation funding, some resources for locating funders and how you might go about researching some funders once you've identified them. So increasingly, uh, only application, applications are only uh, accepted online. So there's a presumption that you've got certain um, that you've got the ability to do that, um, that you've got the facility to do that, uh, and that, that you can kind of walk through the hoops. It can be peculiar because sometimes it's an online form and you have to kind of jump in and get it all in. You can't save until you, know, you, um, until you submit. So you might want to, if you can, get into the environment uh, in which you're supposed to submit your application in advance to make sure you kind of understand how it operates. Um, often is good to have actually drafted everything in advance so you're only cutting and pasting into the boxes if it is a form-based um, online application process. Uh, in part because things are now online and because of increased need, there's a, a tremendous volume of proposals being received by funders uh, for most of, their, of most of their opportunities, unless they're very well defined and only have a discrete type of project that they're interested in. So be aware that the competition can be pretty fierce. Uh, many of the, the government funders will actually tell you what percentage of projects submitted in the last year were funded. Uh, so you can get a sense of whether is it kind of 37% are funded or is it more like 9%? And that can be the kind of thing where you, that might determine whether it's going to be, uh, it's a, whether it is an opportunity you want to pursue or whether you want to maybe look for something that might be a little bit easier as an entry level grant uh, for you to, to receive, to be successful in getting. Um, in part, kind of psychologically, just to kind of build up some momentum and and a sense of success and not just that you're getting um, that you're getting lots of of uh, of, of no's from from funders i cannot overstate the importance of a really compelling narrative and that's why it's it's so critical to really focus on conceptualizing your project and framing it appropriately and one of the things that often will trip up institutions, and it, it's happened to us at Fasara, it, it happened uh, recently to another organization I work with. They were not, it was every, they did everything right, but they weren't able to convince the, the reviewers of the proposal of the significance of their material. Um, and that's a tricky word. And a lot of funders, and this is more the government funders that are focusing on significance. Some of them have, have changed that, so it's not national significance necessarily, but it could, it could be okay if, if to only have local or state significance, but you still have to make that case um, and make it, make it convincing that these materials are indeed really significant for your locality. Uh, measurable delivers, deliverables, and this, they may be called performance objectives um, or performance measures. Sometimes um, proposals also request not only kind of the list of things you are going to have accomplished at the end, the products of the grant, um, but they're going to ask you to evaluate that. 
um, and how successful the entire project was. The IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services in particular, um, the librarians are really into evaluation and, and uh, that's, that's often a component of, of, their, of, their, of their grants. And we're gonna, we're gonna bang on you about this one as well. Interest in alignment of proposed project with your institution's strategic plan. It's gotta, and that's why it's good to have that mission statement, that strategic plan, and those policy and procedure documents to kind of show, and this is why we're trying to do this. It helps you build that rationale for why this project right now makes sense for your institution. Um, other things to keep in mind, uh, there's less of an interest now, um, and this was about 20 years ago when digitization was becoming the thing, you know, it was very easy to get money to digitize some stuff, to put up some stuff online. Um, and it didn't have to kind of connect to anything, really. It just was kind of, you could do this. You could have this, this you know, standalone exhibit on, on whatever topic. But now there's, there's interest in, again, how is this connecting not only to your larger plan for what you're trying to accomplish, but how is it going to help you build capacity? What's going to be the long-term impact of this successful project? And how are you going to sustain it over time? And that can be one of the hardest things because it, it, it often is that you're bringing in project staff. It might be that you're bringing in project staff or you're bringing in an outside contractor to do some work. And then how do you sustain that over time? One of the reasons I think the most recent IMLS APP, Accelerating Promising Practices um, proposal was successful, is that the Moore Free Library in Newfane committed to after the end of the project, continuing to pay their librarian for an additional three or four hours of work a week in order to continue to do community memory work. So showing that with this little boost from you all to get us through kind of a, a big push in this project for the next two years, we're gonna commit to maintaining it over time by actually designating some of our money from this point forward for this work. So that's, that's gonna resonate really well with, with the funder. There also is a lot of interest in collaborative projects. Again, part of why I get excited about trying to figure out how can I work with the Historical Society, the Folklife Center, with UVM, with smaller, um, smaller repositories throughout the state to do something that's coordinated that shows how we're all working together. Um, that's something that funders are really interested in seeing and increasingly an interest in reaching underserved communities. And that can be defined in many ways. Sometimes the funder will define it and will explicitly say what groups it is looking to reach. And in other cases, they will look to you to identify what's the underserved community in, in your locality? Who, who would you wanna to try to serve who you're not reaching now? So you can see how this can tie in with larger um, institutional awareness of their place within their community and what it is that you are providing, what are you not providing that you could be providing, and to try to figure out how, how all of that fits together. So we're not talking so much today about uh, private individuals, uh, and law firms and businesses and other folks who may well be able to be approached to fund your work. Um, I've been working with the Vermont Suffered Centennial Alliance for a couple years now, and for the fundraising, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's been a kind of big combination of all sorts of different types of funding, including the individuals. And it may be that there's folks on your board um, or people in your community who you know have a specific interest that you can, that you can work with. But for today, we're really gonna focus on, um, on government and foundation sources. So just uh, to think about, there's, there's kind of key distinctions of these two types. Um, government funding, it's usually set by legislation. You know, NHPRC, it, it says what they can fund and who they can give the money to. Uh, their application processes, uh, they do change, but they tend to be the same uh, um, for each passing year. They do occasionally play around with with new opportunities. So it's always good to kind of look through 
what's available um, on a fairly regular basis and to know what what they're what they're doing you know NEH had a community um, a community heritage program that lasted two or three years and then it went away um, but it was it was again it was a low level grant that that was easier for smaller institutions to um, apply for and be successful with so good when when you can find something like that they tend to have really firm deadlines um, but they also offer often the opportunity for you to have your draft read by a program officer. And I have full disclosure, I have never done that, but I really think people should. Um, and uh, so don't listen to me. Um, I tend to be a last minute intense, uh, intense up to the wire grant uh, submitter, but I don't follow what I do. Um, I, I know others have worked with program officers and had them review grant drafts and that's immensely helpful. Um, so that's that's really good. That's good to do. Uh, they can offer you technical assistance as well, which they kind of need to do because some of them do require, especially the federal grants, require you to have, um, and, and Erica will get into this, you have to be have multiple kinds of accounts set up and they have to be done weeks in advance and you have to be able to navigate their their, their technological environment, which can be really challenging. But don't let that stop you from, from applying. Um, they are more bureaucratic. Um, it's, 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 it's just gonna be kind of more like a, a massive tanker ship if you're trying to kind of get movement or action uh, or response. It can sometimes be, be seem pretty lugubrious um, and even just kind of the, the amount of time that passes. You know, I submitted a grant to the NHPRC in June. I got questions from staff and, and peer reviewers in September. And the commission's actually gonna vote on it in November. And at some point in December, we'll find out if we're successful. You know, so you gotta kind of assume there's gonna be a, a, big, a big lead time there. But they are usually good on their websites. They'll kind of tell you how, what the different deadlines are, what, what the expectations should be for you and for them. These uh, applications, however, are usually much lengthier. Um, you know, the, the, the typical narrative can be 20 pages um, for, for explaining your project. And there's going to be more requirements. And, and it may be internal forms you have to fill out. It may be that you need to you know, not only have a narrative, but also have a plan of work and a uh, timeline and uh, you know, various types of uh, attachments and appendices that really extend the whole process. Um, and you need to report. Uh, so the grants that I've been, um, been working under recently, it's only every, every year that we need to report. Um, but some of them, it's gonna be every six months, uh, depending on, on on, on sometimes the length of the of the grant itself and sometimes on the funder um, but they they usually want to hear something about how it's going but that's not a bad thing because it's an opportunity to um, for you to kind of check in on how it's going and if you are falling behind or have other things that have made you decide you want to actually change the path of your of what your project's going to be a little bit it's an opportunity to have a conversation with the funder about, you know, about can I switch this a little bit or, you know, there's, we're not traveling. <laughs> so the budget had $30,000 for traveling. Can I move that to getting software for remote interviewing, you know, that kind of stuff. So, so that, that's a good opportunity to engage in, in conversations with your funder. And they often provide more funding. I mean, the more money the government gives you, the more money they expect you to come up with for a match or a cost share. Um, so some of the big challenge grants can, 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 can give you millions of dollars, but you've got to also be coming up with, with sometimes it's a one-to-one -one match, meaning if you're getting a million, you need to come up with a million. Um, the thing is you can match with other sources of funding. It's not that you've got to build that out of your own, um, your own, um, accounts, uh, it may be that you can apply for foundation funding and use that as match for your government grant. Um, and it may be that you're allowed to um, include as part of your cost share staff time spent on the grant. So there's different ways that you can build up 
that match re requirement. Um, and for some of the smaller grants that uh, we think you all might want to consider starting with, um, there's usually, there's often not, no, no need for any kind of cost share, uh, which makes them also more appealing and, and more realistic for, for smaller organizations to, to actually try to, try to go for. Foundation funding, um, one of the biggest challenges is, is it's, you, it's, for some of them, you need to be invited to apply. You can't just lob your application uh, in. Um, it may be a better source for your local needs. There's some foundations that, you know, they're interested in projects in the Northeast Kingdom or in the Upper Connecticut River Valley or in Rutland um, city and town. So knowing what they are, Wyndham has a bunch that are specific to Wyndham um, for Wyndham County. So it, it may be that, that, there's, that there's opportunity there because there's not going to be as much competition, right? Because you're not, you're not applying along with the rest of the country. Um, only certain, certain geographic, it's often geographic bounds, um, are, are able to apply. And it can be a better place to start if you haven't gotten any grant funding in the past. Um, very, very, uh, the best thing about proposals for foundations is that they're less complex. Um, even when I applied for funds from the Mellon Foundation, and we had to be invited, so we, we took the train up from Philadelphia and had an audience with the Mellon Foundation program officers and pitched, it was a, a contingent from Philadelphia, and then we had three different organizations, and we all pitched different proposals, um, and then went away. But then when we were invited to apply, the actual application was kind of like an extended letter. Um, and more recently, I applied to the Bissell Foundation here in Vermont, and it was a two-page letter. Uh, so that is, it's, it's so much that I then emailed to, to my contact, rather than having to kind of go through um, an, an online application apparatus, like you have to if you're applying for a federal grant. And they're easier to administer. They tend to be a little more casual, a little more flexible. Um, they, but they, they might not be able to offer as much support. So they're not gonna read a draft. Um, they may not get back to you right away. Uh, and if you don't, if you're not successful, they may not explain the rejection. Um, even though you should always ask why you did not receive funds. So these are some of the main funders. And again, Federal is, is a huge part of this pot, but there's also state level uh, resources to be available, that are available that you should be aware of. Um, Vermont Division for Historic Preservation. And I should at this point also mention the Preservation Trust of Vermont. Um, and they have a, a, a number of grant programs. Both um, VDHP and Preservation Trust, they're focused more on the buildings but I certainly believe that in some ways the, the, your building is, your, is, is part of your collection often um, and can be the first line of defense between the elements in your collections. So caring for your collections includes and often the first step in caring for your collections should be making sure that your building is stable and secure. So, we're not going to talk a lot about buildings, but that's that. Be aware that there's there are funds um, at the state level in Vermont uh, for for taking care of of buildings. Vermont Arts Council is another with their cultural facilities grant is another opportunity for and and it's a little broader often than um, the VDHP and um, Preservation Trust opportunities. And that cultural facilities grants can also be used not just for improving you know, your roof, but can also be used to mitigate against risk of having um, disasters happen. So you can get some funds to put in um, flood doors or other things that might help. They're also really into funding projects that are gonna make your, um, your facility more accessible. So ramps, uh, bigger doors, automatic doors, that kind of stuff. So good, good opportunities there as well. Um, and there's the possibility uh, that you can get some funds at the municipal level as well. 
And this is, I know we've got some folks from Massachusetts on the webinar, so, and I'm familiar with the environment down there from my years as roving archivist. And one thing Massachusetts has that Vermont does not is the Community Preservation Act funds. And I know communities that have used those funds to hire collections care and archivists to do, uh, to do work. Um, and that, that that was within, again, it's decided at the municipal level how those funds will be used. Um, but it, in some municipalities, they've been successful in using that money for collections care projects. So it may be that there's stuff at the local level as well. So there's a couple tools I like for doing some research on foundations. Um, and I'll show you just a couple screenshots in a moment. And, and also just to think about um, your peer institutions as a great resource. Um, for the Vermont Suffrage Centennial Alliance, and this is slightly different, but the chair of our fundraising committee one of the ways she did research was to um, see in the programs for the Flynn Center and other, um, and other cultural institutions to look and see who, who the ads were from um, in the program and to then kind of develop a list of potential prospects based on that, thinking these are folks who care about culture, maybe they'll care about the Suffrage Alliance. And that, that's proven somewhat successful, even in a pandemic. So, being creative about how you locate sources, but also kind of seeing where, who, who else has given money to whom. Um, so looking at announcements of, of where, where, uh, where grants have come in, where, do, where does their funding come from, you know, look at their annual reports, look at their websites, where, where are they getting uh, the money they need for, for additional projects. And so this is, the, this is the Foundation Center's Visualizing Funding for Libraries tool. And don't be turned off by the libraries part because it's actually broader than that. So this is just an example of a search I did on it for um, funding in support of art conservation or museums in Vermont from 2006 to present. And it will come up with, and you can look at all of this stuff in detail, but you'll see at the highest level, there's 72 grants in that time period that valued 1.6 million, 26 different funders. Um, so that's a pretty big spread. Five recipients. Okay, so there's five institutions in Vermont that have been really successful at getting funding for this type of work. And you can look in and see um, that, yeah, the Calvin Coolidge Memorial Foundation, St. John's Bray Athenaeum, and another way to look at it, they also, because it is a visual tool, um, they show you things like this. So you can see Calvin Coolidge is the big yellow dot and that shows how the connections go, like who's getting money, where is their overlap, where is their kind of outliers. Um, so again, finding, you, can, you can find out more details in, in this tool about how much money, and for what type of project um, did they fund. So it's pretty powerful um, and it is, it's bigger than just libraries um, and you can look for different types of, of, uh, of activity within different types of institutions. Um, so just to give you a sense, of, a sense of that. We also have the Vermont Community Foundation Grant Maker Database and in the last year they've, they've spruced this up. It's a much nicer interface than it was. So I just did a search for museums and archives and special collections in Vermont and came up with uh, quite a few options. And again, you can look in and see and it will tell you, you know, it gives you an idea of how, and you can start to kind of build up a list of prospects based on this. And you might say, you know, this, you know, what, who's these Florida people and what are they giving money? Well, they're only giving $750. I'm not going to worry about that but who's given the most money and where have they given it? Um, so if you look at it, if you click on one of them, you'll get more, more information about the foundation and what they, what they are um, interested in funding and whether you can contact them or not and whether, you know, whether it's uh, invitation only. So this can be helpful. And this is the Bissell Foundation that, and again, I found out about it uh, not by doing internet research, but I knew that the Vermont Historical Society has regularly received funds from them to digitize movies 
films of Vermont subjects. Um, and Bissell has a website, so I was actually able to look and see what other projects they had funded in previous years, and then developed a proposal for the Stufford Centennial Alliance to have a documentary filmmaker um, do a short film about the history of the suffrage movement in Vermont and document to some extent our activities as an alliance as we commemorated the 100th, cent um, 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. That's of course been somewhat complicated as was the approval process. Um, they weren't able to meet in March, so we just found out uh, last week that we were successful. And since the centennial will be extending into 2021, there may well be the opportunity to get some, some live footage um, as well as uh, uh, some stills from the things that did happen either virtually or in person this last year. So these, these resources can help you locate um, potential sources that you might not, you know, might not find otherwise. Uh, a lot of foundations are elusive in that they don't have websites and they're not really advertising the fact that they give away, that they give out money. So it can be, it can be challenging and it can take some time to do this research in terms of identifying potential funders. Um, so if they have a site, you can check, you can look at it, see when they give out money. Is it once a year? Is it quarterly? Um, and you can see, you know, find out as much as you can um, through, and again, this is the part of the, the time consuming prep work. Um, make sure you're, you're familiar with what they're doing and try to identify the funders that best fit your priorities. And again, we're gonna, this is the, this is the really the, the, one of the major takeaways I hope from this morning's webinar. Um, resist the temptation to chase the money. Um, if there's a, 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 an opportunity out there that's, that's offering some kind of, um, some kind of funds for, for uh, doing work that is not at all what you were planning to do in the next five years and is not really connected to your larger strategic plan, really think long and hard. In some cases, it's going to make sense to change track a little bit and find a way to incorporate that into something that you would be willing to do. But for the most part, you, you don't want to be distracted by, by those options. Um, and you really want to try to try to continue to think about what it is you're trying to achieve for your collections um, and what's the most logical set of steps and who are the best funders for those for those steps um, and not to jump not to just jump for for the brand new thing um, yeah so you're going to want to make make contacts if you can with these funders e again easier to do with government funders there those program officers are there to help you um, but maybe less easy with, with foundations. Um, but those contacts could also be with, you know, Calvin Coolidge and with St. John's Ray Athenaeum. So, hey guys, like, so how did you, what kind of projects did you, did you um, get such success with? And how did you inter interact with, with, uh, with the funders? Um, so it can be useful. And I think there's by and large going for grants. It tends to be, I don't think it's overly competitive in that they would be um, unwilling to talk to you about what they've done or how they'd approached their funders or what, what they've learned through the whole process. I think, I think folks tend to be really generous with that kind of information. Um, and then there's also, also folks like Eileen and myself and other members of CCCA who can, can help you as well um, as, you're getting, as you're getting into this process. So again, just to reiterate this point, um, and maybe we do want to pause and or I'll pause. I'm sure you want me to pause. I'm pausing. Um, are there questions that we should engage with at this point? Or do any of my fellow uh, CCCA members want to jump in and, uh, and offer any kind of information? Oh, I'll jump in. Um, Thanks, John. Okay, sorry, I could tell if you could hear me. Um, I, I would just echo a lot of what Rachel has been saying in that, you know, there are 
professionals in the area that are very happy to work with you on, on grant applications. And like she said, it's, it's way more than just writing a letter of commitment. It's, it's really helping you decide what sort of projects are most suitable and how to help develop a most, more convincing grant application. Um, working with you on the narrative, if that's something you want help with. Um, but there are a lot of us here that really enjoy doing these grant funded projects. So don't, don't hesitate to reach, reach out to us. We're, we're here to do that. And that's part of our mission as, as preservation professionals. And I'll jump in. Darlene, you're muted. How did that happen? <laughs> um, I'd also like to jump in and say that if you've applied for a grant and you weren't successful, please don't think that that's the end of it. Don't, you know, not to move forward. Look for other funding sources as Rachel has explained. Find what matches you and apply again. Have, you know, reach out to a professional, someone on the CCCA board, anyone that's been mentioned, and ask them to look things over for you and see where maybe your weaknesses are and where you need to strengthen something. And then apply again because you will eventually be successful. Oh, and I can't resist. I see Lauren Glenn Davidian is, um, is on the webinar um, at CCTV. And CCCTV, CCTV, CCTV. And I, one of the groups that I'd love to work with are the cable access uh, stations. And again, that's a great opportunity for, and I know there've been preliminary conversations about preserving your assets. So you know, that's something where, and my tendency is to try to think big. So sometimes I need to be reined back into, you no, know, we need to focus on what we need here at our station. Um, but I also am always looking for ways that we can leverage your need. If you have need, others probably in similar situations have the same needs. And can we amplify that and apply together? So I would like to talk with you more about what we could do to move that forward. And I just want to say, um, Eileen has dropped into the chat box another source for a great small grant program. So be sure that you check out that website as well. Yeah, and thanks for bringing that up, Eileen. Um, that's something that when I was reviewing some possibilities for the old Stonehouse Museum to consider applying for, I noticed, you know, it's not a lot of money, but they have to give one to Vermont every year. And a couple institutions have gotten grants more than once. My sense is because they're not getting a lot of applications from Vermont. So it's also partly knowing the, you know, sensing what the opportunities are. Again, this is one where they have to take someone from Vermont. A lot aren't bothering to apply. So the, the odds are better. Okay, well, I think Erica, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute myself and let you take over. All right, everybody. Um, I am uh, taking over the second half of our presentation and focusing a little bit more, taking us from the macro, um, a little bit more closely looking at specifics for preparing your application, your proposal for a specific project. So we'll be um, talking about diving in, how to conceptualize your specific project, preparing to draft your proposal. Uh, we'll be sharing a lot of tips and strategies for you for developing that proposal and also talking about some common concerns. So let's move on to conceptualizing. So definitely you want to make sure that your project is aligned with not only your own organization's values, interests, and needs, but also with the interests of the funding agency that you're thinking about applying to. So hopefully, um, I would think the best case scenario would be is if you developed kind of a wish list projects that you wanted to accomplish say in the next five years and then kind of um, look to see what's out there for granting programs at the federal level and the foundation level that might fulfill one or more of those projects um, and so you're going to be you know kind of going back and forth between big picture strategic thinking um, doing your research on what's out there for funding and also in-house kind of looking at what your priorities are for um, specific collections care needs. Um, 
So you're also at the same time, hopefully, um, thinking about how to work with others to further flesh out your project ideas. If it's a project where you'll have collaborators within your community, maybe reach out and have a preliminary conversation um, and get some agreement and some momentum so moving forward so that before you actually start drafting a proposal, you have a commitment from your partners to move forward. So you're not wasting time um, developing that specific proposal without making sure that you have the partners that you need in hand. And that goes for both um, other organizations, if you're partnering with other organizations, and also um, collections professionals who can work with you on projects. Um, we would definitely also advise you to start small. If you haven't necessarily applied for funding for collections care projects before, you might want to start with an assessment. So where that is, um, where someone might come in and provide you with some kind of big picture advice about how to handle your collections in a number of different areas. And with that an assessment in hand, you can then go out and seek funding for specific projects. So particularly when you're starting out for seeking funding for collections projects, you wanna set real and realistic goals. So what's appropriate for both for your collection and your organization? Are you a small shop with a small staff or all entirely volunteer based? Um, so have those conversations among your, yourselves and your board about what's realistic, what you can accomplish. Um, maybe focus on going after one project at a time rather than trying to spread yourselves thin and, um, and trying to hit every deadline that's coming up. So when you actually sit down to start working on your proposal, you definitely want to make sure that you are aware of all the pieces that need to come together. So what is the funder requiring for a narrative, for the budget, for uh, bios, for all of the staff, for the appendices? Um, develop a list, a checklist for yourself if there isn't one that's in the package. Read and reread those guidelines over and over, making sure that you fit their criteria. Are you the right kind of organization for the project? Um, do your collections meet their specifications? Um, do you have the staff that you need? Uh, some of the federal uh, programs, for example, require that you have a full-time staff member or the volunteer equivalent. So before you spend a lot of time and effort working on a proposal, making sure, make sure that you meet those guidelines. And this would be a really good time to get in touch with a program officer if there's a contact person that you can reach. Sound them out first before you put anything in writing. Um, also make sure that your grant application is targeted to that specific uh, program or that specific funder. There may be pieces that you can cut and paste between different applications, but you definitely want to make sure that um, your proposal is specific. It's not generic, so that your appeal, so that you have demonstrated to the funder that you know um, about what they're interested in funding, and that you are committed to making sure that you meet their guidelines. Definitely making sure that you stay on task um, in terms of timing with meeting those deadlines is critical, um, particularly the, the larger federal programs. Um, putting that proposal together does take time, both internally as far as writing the narrative and assembling all the pieces. And if there's a partner on board, whether it be a, an organization in your community or a, an external professional that you're working with, you need to make sure that there's enough lead time to get those letters of commitment, to flesh out the specific pieces of the project that involve them, that there's time for some back and forth so that you're not putting everything together at the 11th hour and um, missing some specifics that your reviewers might, might have questions about um, because it was a rush to the finish line. Definitely remember that grantors really do want to give out money. They have these pots of money and that's that's their, their whole reason for being, right? So um, 
have those conversations with the program officers really early on. They'll be encouraging um, if they think your project is a good fit for their program. Um, and definitely, um, I want to reiterate what Carolyn said, I believe, um, that if your program, if your proposal is not successful the first time around, make sure that you reach out and ask for feedback um, so that you can either reapply for that particular program the next time that funding cycle comes along or that you can use that feedback to apply for another project. So you're building on the process and um, getting better and better at submitting proposals as time goes on. Here's um, some tips for writing a successful proposal. First, see what else is out there. Um, oftentimes, uh, funding agencies will post examples of other proposals from previous funding cycles that have been successful. So what worked for those organizations um, that might be a conceptual framework for you? Um, and how are they, um, how are they structuring the actual project, the work plan? How are they structuring their narrative? Um, all those pieces can help inform you and help you craft a better proposal. We can't state um, more, um, more frequently enough that you need to make sure that you're following the funder's guidelines. So do you have your checklist in front of you? Have you made sure that all the pieces that you need to submit are ready to go? And that the numbers and concepts match up from one document to the uh, next. So um, something that happens frequently is that um, sometimes there's a, a change towards the last minute in terms of the budget or the staff or some other aspect of the plan. And so you need to make sure, double check that your budget document, the numbers in your budget document match what you say in the project narrative, for example, or that you've listed all of the staff in the narrative and included their bios or their CVs if you need to include those as the appendices. So make sure all those pieces line up. Definitely, this is your opportunity to, to shine. You know, uh, everybody, uh, every organization has its strength, has its you know, greatest hits as far as collections are concerned, and you are the best person to tell your story. So um, this is a great opportunity for you to talk about your organization and to show your passion for your project. So definitely also be thinking about the significance of your collection. Rachel mentioned this early on and I wanna reiterate it. Um, some funders are very clear that you need to have, you need to be able to demonstrate national significance. Um, and if that's the case, then make sure you follow those guidelines. But in any case, for any proposal, it's really important that you're telling the, the funders and the reviewers why this project is significant to you. Are the collections um, really important to your community? Are the, the, the items that, you're, that are the focus of your project the ones that um, are the most heavily used by your patrons? Are they the pieces that you are planning to put in your headliner exhibition for the next year. Um, so those are, it's definitely really important to make sure that you're conveying the significance of the collections in question um, to your organization and to your audience. Also, I, I can't state this um, more, make sure that you've tested out your proposed workflow or your methodology in advance. Um, if you are going to have volunteers be rehousing photographs or documents, for example. Um, do a trial run, even if you don't have the appropriate acid-free materials on hand. Make sure that you know how much time it takes for one person to uh, refolder a box of manuscripts, for example, if that's a key component of your project. Same thing goes for digital assets. If you are digitizing collections or if you are cataloging materials or inventorying them, do a dry run as much as possible with the, the staff and supplies and equipment that you have on hand so that you have a good sense of how long it's going to take and state that clearly in your proposal. 
it definitely will impress your your um, reviewers if you can say, I did a time trial. This is um, this is these are the results of the time trial. Here's the trial and error that we've already worked out. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Those kinds of aspects will go a long way with your reviewers. So, <clears throat> excuse me, another tip is um, have some boilerplate language ready to go that you can massage for a specific project. This will save you time when it gets to the point of writing a specific proposal and allow you to um, change and adapt as necessary going forward. So have a paragraph available on the history of your organization and your collections um, ready to go so that you can slip that into your narrative. Likewise, make sure that you have your 501c3 documentation ready to roll so that you don't waste valuable time trying to track down the copy that you need to submit. And if this is allowed, um, include photographs or images of the materials in question. And those could be like wow snapshots of the greatest hits of your collection that are part of your, your proposal. But they could also be the, um, the, the before pictures of what you, you know, showing what um, the current status or the current condition of your collection is that you hope to mitigate with this particular project. So don't be afraid to show the, the funder and the reviewer a little bit of your dirty laundry because everyone's got it and, um, you know, you're really demonstrating the need there. And also images are just great eye candy for reviewers who are reading one application after another. If they can see an image every now and again, it, um, it really breaks up the day and um, helps and it will make your proposal stand out. Um, speaking of making your proposal stand out and making it easier for the reviewers to go through, um, Think about things like uh, using bullet points and white space, um, using clear and concise language. Oftentimes there is a, a page limit or a word, word limit for project narratives. And those are really helpful actually because they make you be more concise and they make sure that the reviewers don't start turn, tuning you out if they have to read 20 pages versus five. Um, Coming up with a catchy title really helps too, particularly if you're submitting a proposal to a federal program where you know the reviewers are going to be each responsible for reviewing, say, up to 10 proposals in one go. If you've come up with a catchy title, you've set yourself apart and it will make it easier for people to remember your project. Um, avoid jargon. Um, keep in mind that particularly if your project has a te technical aspect, um, not all of your reviewers or the, the pro program officers will be particularly familiar with the specifics of the technical aspect. So make sure that you are being clear and that you've referenced those technical specifications as best practices in the field, perhaps slipped in a, um, a, a web link so that people could do more research if they were interested, um, but make sure that your proposal is written in, in plain English for people coming from a variety of aspects of the arts and cultures fields um, to, to be able to um, review it without getting stuck. And just a few more tips for you. Um, substantive support letters. Do you have a, um, a municipal leader who can um, write a letter of support? Or do you have a, um, a, someone who's representative of a patron group that would benefit from this, um, this project? Um, do you have an affinity group um, that is interested in a, the particular component of your collections that you're seeking funding for. Um, so definitely include those support letters and it's okay if you draft 
the the bulk of the support letter for someone to review and tweak and then sign for you. That will save them a lot of time and you'll get more buy-in from for those support letters if you can if you can show that you've you've started the process for them if there's less work for them to do. You definitely want to use outside readers, um, both colleagues and generalists, you know, when for any project when you um, are, you know, doing a deep dive in your head into a particular project, it's really easy to get lost in the weeds and uh, forget a critical aspect because you're so closely involved in it. It's um, really important to have someone copy edit your, um, your proposal uh, because certainly I know, at least for me, you know, the, I, could read, I could read something, a draft 20 times and still miss a glaring copy edit error error that it's in because it's my my own work and my eyes just gloss right over that and definitely go back to that checklist of all the different aspects of the proposal that you need to submit and make sure that you are um, following the guidelines are you submitting things in the correct order sometimes there's specific instructions for file names or file formats making sure that you have all your pieces ready to go when you are ready to submit um, is really important. I wanna go back to the importance of the wow factor. I mean, uh, I think we referenced this a couple times. Um, images um, are really great for doing this, catchy titles, um, and even you know the airing some aspects of your dirty laundry. Um, being honest and transparent about the fact that you're not meeting best practices in certain areas and that you're using this grant as a stepping stone to get there. That will be really impressive to your reviewers um, and could make all the difference. Okay, a couple other considerations here. Um, what to expect when working with a consultant with an outside professional? Um, Keep in mind that um, conservators and collections care professionals are probably um, being approached by several different organizations um, for a, to meet a, a certain funding deadline, especially for the bigger, uh, the bigger uh, federal grants. Um, so it's really important while um, all of those projects uh, a professional can probably handle the implementation. It's really important to give them enough lead time to um, be able to provide you the information that you need and to work with you to shape the aspect of the project they're involved with um, and do that with enough advance notice so that they have time to adequately support you. Um, typically, the, the parts of the a proposal that a consultant might help you shape or support would be in addition to supplying a letter of commitment that would outline um, in clear and concise terms what they'll be responsible for, what their deliverables are, and what their requirements are as far as compensation. Um, they will often supply you with a bio or a resume for different um, components of your proposal. And they can also help you uh, hammer out what your project work plan is and be a really good um, uh, kind of provide some back and forth support over whether um, your, your budget for supplies is realistic and your, 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 your timeline, the timeline that you have in mind is also realistic. Keep in mind that particularly for the larger federal uh, programs, you will need to have registered with them ahead of time before you can apply for a grant. And that's something that you wanna do at least several weeks in advance, if not longer, um, so that you can have all your ducks in a row and focus on the actual proposal in the days leading up to the deadline. So um, Rachel may have Rachel, chime in if you have some more specific guidance on um, the DUNS number or the grants.gov res uh, registration um, information that people need to put together. Oh, just that you, you need to have a DUNS number 
Um, and then you have to register for a SAM account. Um, that's for the awards. That's the award management system that the federal government use, uses. And grants.gov is the environment in which you actually submit your application. And there have been lags of up to three or four weeks um, before the SAM and the grants.gov get, um, get activated. Another thing to, and this is what catches, has that it caught us up. You also need to keep those accounts active. Um, and there's a, oh, I think it's called an eBiz, eBiz POC. Um, so the, the point of contact POC for, for your entity, your organization within these environments needs to be identified and you need to renew your registration on a fairly regular um, timetable. So we got caught because our eBiz POC was on a vacation very far away and we needed to renew. And it, so it's just, it's something that just kind of, again, it doesn't, as long as you're aware of it and you keep it in your calendar as a, you know, need to do this, um, it's not, it shouldn't trip you up, but it's something to really be, be aware of that until you become real comfortable with it, it, it can it can grind your entire um, vision to a halt because you you can't you're too late. Okay, I want to spend a couple minutes talking about the the budget specifics on the budget. Um, Rachel mentioned before um, different strategies for coming up with a cost share. Um, you definitely want to look at the guidelines for the particular program that you're thinking about applying to, but keep in mind that oftentimes staff time or volunteer time can be used as a as a match. Um, and also um, other forms of cost sharing, um, you might have individual donors, perhaps people who are on your board or people who are friends of yours in the local community that you could approach to um, provide, contribute to that cost match. And um, I can't stress enough how important it is um, to have your cost share match identified um, and making sure that you're meeting the guidelines for that before you submit your proposal. So I know it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg situation here because each party, the grantor and the potential contributors to the cost share match, it's, if, it's a co if it's a cash match, often want to know that the other party is already committed. So sometimes you can go back and forth on that a little bit. But to the best of your uh, ability, your proposal will be much more successful if you have a solid cash match in hand or commitment thereof before you submit your proposal. And oftentimes, the funding organization or agency will require that in your proposal. Also, it's important to note that um, reviewers are looking out for people who are padding their budget. And that goes for not only um, adding a little bit to the actual uh, cash aspects of your budget, but also padding it out by putting in extra staff time beyond what is necessary. So this, again, is where your, your time trials, your methodology, specific aspects of your project work plan can really help you out. Can you demonstrate that your director is really going to spend 10% of their time supervising the project and preparing the, the reports that are required for this grant? Can you demonstrate that your volunteers are really going to put in 30 hours over two months um, with the, the actual aspects of the rehousing work that you have in mind. Um, so finally, some other uh, strategies to consider. Um, one is the phased approach. We've already mentioned this a little bit. Um, applying for funding for an assessment first and using that assessment report to strengthen your case for a specific for follow-up funding for a specific project and certain uh, funders that are out there actually have structured their grants this way so that there is kind of a phased approach but definitely the more um, that you can show that you've done your homework that you have that assessment in hand 
um, that will be a really great strategy for you to demonstrate your need um, to a funder for an actual follow-up project uh, that benefits the collection. Also, don't forget the backdoor approach. Um, you can always find ways to tack on small amounts of collections care um, projects to another project that is primarily focused on programs. So for example, I recently got a public humanities grant. Um, and so that um, has a very clear deliverable in terms of an, an event and a student research component, but I was able to argue successfully that I needed $250 for acid-free folders to rehouse the collection that the students were going to be looking at in the reading room in order to have them safely handle those materials so that they could produce the product that they were going to produce for the grant. Uh, another example might be if you're, if you're applying for funding for an exhibition, um, make, you could roll in the cost of uh, conservation or conservation quality framing into your exhibition project. And uh, those are aspects that are definitely direct, have direct benefit to your collection, but are very real costs for a specific program or, or exhibition and that make a lot of sense to, to, to bundle with a, a program project. So some common concerns, some things to keep in mind, some pitfalls, potential pitfalls. Lack of communication with a program officer. Um, it's definitely best practice to get in touch with a, a program officer in advance if you can. Um, and certain funders um, will 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 kind of look askance at your project if you have if you've submitted a proposal but you haven't done this. So make sure that you've done your homework and 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 uh, figured out who requires it and who strongly advises it. Um, some projects require you to submit a draft first before you submit your final proposal, um, and that communication piece is really important. Make sure that you're following the latest guidelines from your funding agency or foundation. Um, oftentimes, we are all looking ahead one fund funding cycle, which is great to look to plan in advance. Um, but then the latest guidelines are posted, say, six weeks or two months before an actual deadline. And it's really important to make sure that you're using um, the, the guidelines from the current funding cycle. Uh, to prepare your, your actual proposal. If your collections are poorly described or quantified, your reviewers will have a hard time knowing if your scope of work, if your calendar, if your budget is adequate um, and realistic and accurate. So um, it's fine to say, you know, we have approximately 2,000 photographs that are currently housed in six boxes or take up a certain amount of linear feet. You may not have a specific number um, ahead of time, but the closer you can get, the better. If you are um, targeting a specific type of collection, you're going to want to give your reviewers um, a sense of the format involved, the material type, um, as well as the quantity. So instead of saying textiles, well, what do you mean by textiles? Are we talking about garments? Are we talking about needlework? Um, uh, images, for example, are we talking about print photography? Are we talking about slides? Are we talking about digital images? Um, maybe your project is dealing with multiple types or formats. And so if you can give reviewers a sense of how many of each type or format you have that are going to be covered in this project, um, that will be really helpful information. It's important to make sure that your project work plan is pretty detailed. Um, so have you, uh, you know, which aspects of the project are you gonna focus on in which phase? 
Um, which aspects would an outside professional be helping you with? Um, so what are specific people involved in the project working on? What are the different aspects of the project or different phases? How long do you anticipate each phase taking? Um, and which aspects do you need the supplies that you've asked for? Typos. Um, you know, of course, reviewers are going to be forgiving for, you know, everyone, no matter how good they are, is going to submit a proposal that has a few typos or other copy edit issues. But if your proposal is full of misspellings or um, spacing errors or, um, or other typos, um, you've started yourself off on the wrong foot with your reviewers because they're going to wonder if you kind of put this together slapdash at the last minute or if this is really a, a strategic project that that is something that you've been um, working for long term. Letters of commitment, letters of support, those are really essential um, and oftentimes they're required when you're going to be working with a community partner organization or uh, and a conservator or other collections care professional. Um, but even if they're not required and you're able to put them in as an attachment, they're definitely, that's a best practice to do that. Same thing with letters of support. If you have a, a um, municipal government, a mayor or someone else from a, a friends group, um, they can um, certainly provide um, really important documentation that your project is indeed important to your community. Missing information on project staff. Um, sometimes resumes are required and so they're definitely they should be part of the checklist that you're preparing when you're when you're figuring out what you need to submit with your proposal. Um, certainly if if attachments or appendices are allowed um, resumes or like a, a bio page where you put in a paragraph about each person who's working on the project are definitely um, strongly encouraged. Budget errors, I referenced this earlier. So not only talking about making sure that you've done the math correctly here, but also that the numbers that you're submitting on your budget sheet match the numbers that you've written in your narrative and other parts of the documentation. Okay, so we are ready to roll. We're really hoping that you're interested in um, perhaps joining a cohort of people who are, who are applying for upcoming grants. There are a number of opportunities coming up in the next three to four months, both um, on the federal level and also more locally. Um, Carolyn, I don't know if you want to speak to this particular grant opportunity, which is coming up on November 1st. I'd certainly love to have you weigh in on it um, since you, I think, have been involved with at least one proposal so far. Sure. So this, this was a grant that sort of went away for a little while, and, and I was very pleased to see that it has come back this year, and the, the deadline is coming right up um, November 1st. But this is a really great project that the American Institute of Conservation partners with TrueView Optium, who makes um, preservation, museum quality, UV filtering, plexiglass. And it basically, it's, it's a very easy application to fill out. It's one of those sort of low, low key applications that Rachel and Erica both talked about. Um, and basically you can use it to apply to have conservation treatment done on one or several items in a collection. Um, and then the, that object or series of objects would then be framed or displayed with the UV filtering plexiglass that's donated from TrueView. Um, I, I've done I've done projects where there were several historic prints that we treated in the conservation studio and then were framed and matted using these museum quality archival materials. And then I also did an interesting project where a library had an antique barrister's bookcase that they wanted to use for displaying objects from their historic collection. And they actually sent the bookcase um, out to be retrofitted with the UV filtering plexi. So you can be creative. And, and they were really excited to have something a little bit more 
interesting to work on down at Small Core, Small Core in Massachusetts for that. So again, it's, it's a pretty quick application process. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to, to anyone at CCCA if you need help um, finding a consultant to work with. And, and we're, we're happy to, to walk you through the application process, even though it's, it's getting a little down to the wire. But that's, I think both Rachel and Erica said, that's kind of the nature of the beast of grant applications. So I would at least encourage you to check it out and see if you can think of something in your collection that would be a good candidate for this. Yeah, and this might be um, and, and one of those examples of something where it is an opportunity and it's not going to take a huge amount of your time and effort to pursue. So maybe, maybe you do kind of do a side detour and see if this is, and it may be that there's a latent need like, oh yes, that, that thing that the, that the board president has hanging in the office really should be protected better. Let's, that, let's do that because there's this funding available. Um, but yeah, and you would want to just kind of, this is the kind of the first thing you might look at. So, you know, I hope that as you read through this, you're thinking about some of the stuff that Erica and I have talked about. So yeah, one thing I would flag is it's due November 1st. All right, so you gotta, you gotta kind of jump on this one. Um, kind of skimming, skimming, you have to know what the hell glaze. Yeah, go ahead. I think that they also will have a second application deadline on May 1st. Ah. But I don't know that for sure. But that's that's sort of what was hinted at. So mm -hmm. if you yeah, can't and that's a, get it together for November first, but you have something that you think would be a good project, um, you know, keep checking on the AIC website, and it will it will update you when it's time to to apply for the second round of funding. Right, and it's always totally legitimate to if you do make contact with program officer, say, hey, I'm really interested in this. That's that deadline's coming up really quick. Will this opportunity be offered again? And they might be cagey, but they might be able to give you some real, some real um, definite information there about whether or not, like, yeah, this is one and done, or yeah, we intend to uh, um, offer this again in 2021. So uh, again, you won't know that unless you talk to them, or you talk to Triple C A, and someone like Carolyn's got an inside track. You know, so there's again, just to have your feelers out and to be in, in communication with people. Um, so yeah, just looking through this, like what is a glazing application? That might be a question like what, you know, what's the terminology? Do I even know what they're, what they're offering here? Um, and then kind of, you uh, gotta be a not pro not for profit. Okay. Gotta be located here. Okay. Must have at least one full-time conservator on staff, but, or a conservator on contract. So I would want to initiate one of my immediate goals here, if I was interested in this opportunity, would be to reach out to a conservator um, or to reach out to Triple C A and say, "Hey, I'm interested in this. Who do you know among the professional affiliates that would be um, an appropriate person to work with on this proposal?" And then making sure that the funds are going to be able to be of use to you in terms of what they're going to cover. And it looks like that might work. How much? Up to three thousand. And the free glazing, no indication that you've got to come up with any money. So then again, there's a link. So I would go read more. But on the preliminary review, it's kind of okay. This this might actually fly. You know, assuming you do have some something that that ought to be reglazed or glazed for the first time because you you would love to be able to uh, to display it. Um, so I think at this point we are coming on time. Um, I just want to reiterate that we really want to work with you and I'm going to send out a list of some of these modest grants that we think are good for starting with um, to everyone who's on on the webinar and a quick questionnaire just to see if you're interested in being part of a cohort um, or if you want to have time to talk one on one about some ideas you have and to bat some stuff around. I would love to do that, and um, depending on the type of project you're thinking of, I might um, might connect you with someone else on Triple C three A who might be more appropriate for you to be advised by. Um, so let's see if there's any any questions for us. Rachel, I'm going to jump in. There's a question from Alex at the St Albans Museum about uh, crafting projects that have a, a staff plus volunteer component. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a number of different ways you can go about this. Um, maybe the staff is the 
grants contact the person developing the proposal, submitting it, responsible for reporting, but the actual legwork for the collections care project is completed by the volunteers who are uh, perhaps contributing your, their cost share, your cost share match in terms of um, their volunteer hours. Um, another way that you can do it is you can either yourself as a staff person or perhaps um, hire an external person to come in and do a training session. And so it's a combination of using professional expertise with uh, volunteer time that can be really successful. So if the, the staff person is supervising the work or perhaps preparing the work plan and um, the volunteers are implementing that, that's a great way to do it. You may also have uh, one particular volunteer who can become your expert who can, um, working with the staff person, develop the work plan and um, train other volunteers among your cadre of, of, of people that, that you are, are from your community that you work with to help you do the implementation. Can I, can I jump in and add to that? Um, yeah, so I've done several grant funded projects that did incorporate a volunteer training aspect. Um, I did a NEH funded preservation assistance grant at Landmark College in their library and archives. And I, I went down and looked at the collection and helped them decide exactly what rehousing materials they needed, how to improve general storage and handling conditions. But I also, as part of that grant, went down and taught the library archives manager and her group of volunteers how to actually do the rehousing project themselves. So a lot of these grants have, have room for, for tying in staff and volunteers and the consultant. And I think um, when I've served as a grant reviewer, you, you want to see those kinds of applications because you, you want this, this knowledge and expertise to be spread out as much as possible. So I think when, when you can include um, working with volunteers and training volunteers or staff that don't have prior experience, that makes a, can make a really strong grant application. Um, another example, I've, I've been working with the historic theater curtains projects for conservation treatment and curtains without borders. And that's a big part of the, those, those projects that are grant funded. As Michelle knows, part of that is training the volunteers at those local historical societies or town halls how to help do the actual preservation of those historic theater curtains. So I think that's a great question. And I think that's a good thing to really keep in the back of your minds as you're applying for grants and sort of structuring how the project might, might work. Uh, one oh. other thing to, to add, to just piggyback on that, Carolyn, is that um, if you are coming from an organization that is primarily consists of volunteer labor, or perhaps even an all volunteer historical society, for example, you, um, I think reviewers will be really receptive to projects that um, spread out the expertise um, and also don't rely on one person to, to do the work. Because um, there's, there's always uh, the consciousness that, um, that volunteers often ha are wearing many hats for many different commitments and so uh, perhaps some of them are in our neck of the woods are seasonal so they might be um, involved in an organization during the temperate months and then um, are going as a snowbird to a different part of the country for other parts of the year um, so if you can spread out the expertise both during the project and then also demonstrate that you've thought about the long-term sustainability of that expertise um, in terms of passing the baton to other uh, a new board for example in a few years um, that will be that's a great way to um, make a very uh, compelling argument for your proposal i'll add one more thing too just to sort of piggyback on that um, another tactic that has worked really well um, and some of the grants that I've worked on is if you are having a consultant come in and teach a workshop or talk about a specific issue that might also be relevant to other organizations in your area, if, you, if, in, if you're willing to extend 
an invitation to them to attend that workshop or training session, and you, you can include that in your grant application, and reviewers will give you extra stars for that, because again, you're, you're, you're spreading that knowledge as far as possible, and that can give you a really big, big leg up. And it gives you a good chance to, to meet your colleagues if you don't know them and, and figure out other ways that you guys can work together. Um, so I think that's another great thing to think about. So we had a question from Eliza, a, a very good one about, can you say a little more about your vision for a cohort? Um, and I'll just say that it really, it's dependent on on what people want and what you're what you are wanting to do i there's a possible few few scenarios one would be that in sifting through the folks who um who reach out that we determine that yeah the, the 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 grant that we were just talking about the national endowment for the humanities preservation assistance grant for small institutions is something that would be appropriate for three or four different organizations to be applying for that we would each, each, each organization would work independently on their proposal, but maybe as a cohort, we would try to set some timelines and deadlines and have an informal get together every couple of weeks just for a progress report. It can often, especially if you're a loan arranger um, or if you've got uh, many other pressing responsibilities or both are true for you, it can be really tough to find the, the time and the headspace for working on a proposal. So sometimes if you have a deadline, you're like, oh shoot, I'm meeting with, I'm meeting with Eliza next week. I've got to be able to show her I've done something. That might be, a, might be able to help motivate some folks to actually move forward on this project. Um, and I can, I can alternately cheerlead and like threaten um, if that would be effective. You just have to let me know what works best for you. Um, so my sense is that we can, we can try to, to move, move each other forward um, and, and, and um, I'm trying to do more of this collaborative stuff virtually. Um, actually going to do some genealogical research as a group next week, uh, which is going to be fun. So this idea of kind of how can we, we're all working independently yet together um, and, and working that way. It may be more likely that there's different opportunities that different folks are working on, um, but it may still be useful to come together um, just to share What's 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 what are the obstacles for you? What are you caught on? What are you having trouble articulating? Um, especially with, I, I found it really difficult to to make my proposals sing. Um, the heyday for me of grant application writing was when I was at Historical Society of Pennsylvania because we had a development officer, and I would do the nuts and bolts of this is what we want to do, hand the narrative off to her. And she would just make it shine and just make it sound like these things were the most amazing materials you've ever come across. Um, being the historical side of Pennsylvania, that was often true. But I had trouble kind of honking the horn. Uh, so sometimes it might be that we can find someone here is, within our group is really good at, 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 you know, hyperbolic but not over the top language in terms of describing uh, materials and and how fabulous they are. So I feel like there's a lot of opportunity to help to help each other out and to be those those outside leaders for each other um, and and offers offer support and and substantive critique. Any other any other comments or questions? I just want to make sure everyone saw in the chat that Carolyn has added in um, the site for another grant with its deadline being January 14, 2021. So be sure to, to take note of that. And I'd yeah. just like to say that, um, I'm sorry, um, I'd just like to say that, you know, if you can benefit so much by collaborating with your colleagues in the area with um, one another because not only does that build strengthening for you applying for grants if you go into a cohort situation or just reach out with um, questions that you have but it, it also helps you again know who's in the area get to meet people because in new england we are so spread out and we don't always have the opportunity to come together and network or meet one another sometimes it's only at an annual conference and sometimes the budgets do not allow for that annual conference so that networking opportunity is lost so just be sure to, you know, try to reach out with others that you have met here today in the webinar or certainly through CCCA, we can get you engaged with others and just 
feel like you're not alone and that there are others out there facing the same problems that you have and facing the same needs and wants um, to move themselves forward and get their collections really well in shape and develop those standards and best practices. So I see that um, Eileen has had to leave. So this makes me, I guess, in charge of things. So one thing I'd like to ask is if there are any other questions that um, you might have or something we haven't touched upon. Okay, so seeing as how there are no specific questions, let me just close out with a few things. First of all, we'd like to thank you very much for joining us today, and we hope you found that today's webinar has been informative and maybe has given you some new ideas, maybe has given you support and enthusiasm to approach this. And remember, as um, I had mentioned, and as Erica had mentioned, if the first time doesn't work, don't worry, try again, find out what went wrong and just keep plugging along because eventually you will get some money. Let the CCCA know what kind of workshops, presentations, lectures you'd like to have us make available to you um, by sending us an email. And I did include that in the chat box in a couple of places. Plus, I will follow up with each of you with a follow-up email from the CCCA. Just thanking you for joining us today and reminding you of a few things that I'll be mentioning here. So don't have to worry about taking your notes. Um, check out, again, on our website, our membership criteria and consider applying. It's easy and it's reasonable. And at least for the end of this year, we are offering free membership for students and emerging professionals. So that's a good way to start networking, who, find out who's in the field and what's going on. Um, hopefully you'll be able to join us at 9 a.m. on Saturday, October 31st for a Halloween coffee break during the Vermont Lakes Conference. Uh, so put that on your calendars if you're attending the conference. Um, one last note I'd like to mention is that should any in the audience be archivists or anyone interested in culture, preservation, archives, and history, be sure to check out Archives in Context. You can find that information on the CCCA website. Again, that website was included in the chat um, under the events tab, and the email address to register is also in the details. It's a month-long series of weekly conversations with noted professionals in the field here in New England. Uh, Rachel was last week's, one of the moderators for last week's panel. Carolyn and I will be on this evening's panel. And again, it's week-long, so it's uh, in the evenings at 6.30. And the series is free, it's open to the public, and celebrates National Archives Month, which is this month of October. So if there is nothing else that my colleagues from the board would like to mention, I will just say thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Okay, everybody, I guess that's Everyone. it. So, so anybody have anything else to say? Okay, so with that, thank you again. Take care and we'll see you in the future. Yep, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Hi, Meta. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Hi, Peter. I want to get to know you. <laughs> All right. See All right, ya. Guys. Bye. Bye.